I'm here with Tony Cheney at his house. Um, I met Tony back in 2011 at the John Coots Benefit at St Mary's RSL. Um, Tony was playing with the Arms Reinhardt from Chase the Sun. And how did you meet the Arm? Well, Greg, um, I'd been um, doing quite a few things in music, and um, at one stage, when I was actually making a living out of it, because I, I always had a a day gig. Uh, most of the time I've been in music, but at this stage I decided to just do music full time. And so I was, you know, getting gigs for my band, the Gin House Blues Band. Um, and I found that I had a lot of time on my hands apart from, you know, trying to find gigs. So then I decided, well, look, you know, I can probably manage it a band or two, um, give me some extra income. So I put an ad in um, Drum Media, the newspaper, music newspaper that was out back then, and um, I, I got about 110, 120, um, whether it be CDs, we had tapes back then, um, of different bands wanting, you know, to get managed. So even though I um, had a lot of great bands and material, you know, I might have been wrapped in their style of music. So um, a lot of good bands didn't get chosen, not, you know, only because if I'm going to manage a band, then my heart's got to be into what they're doing, you know. And probably two weeks down the track I received this tape um, from this young band and they were called Whatever um, spelled W-A-T-T-E-V-A -T -T -E and um, I opened up the package and um, here was this note Dear Mr Manager and I thought these guys must be young um, you know we're young um, but we are a professional band. So I, I, I put the, um, this was a CD, I put the CD on and I um, thought, wow, these, <laughs> these guys are really good. At the time, they had Jan's sister, Emma, uh, was the, the vocalist, and I thought, these guys are really good. And then I heard his guitar playing, and um, I thought, man, this guy's as good as just about any guitar player I know in Sydney. Um, so I rang, at the time I thought J-A-N was Jan. Um, so I rang the number and Jan's mother answered the phone and I said, oh, can I speak to Jan? And she goes, you mean Jan? I said, oh, okay. I thought, oh, it's a male. So, um, Anyway, I said, mate, look, you know, I really like your... There was five tracks on the demo. I really like your original songs. I said, um, at the time we were doing a gig at the Grace Danes Inn, um, and I had Kelly Bradford in the band from Heaven, who was a monster guitar player, Michael Smith on bass from um, the band Scandal, and um, Bruce Stevens on drums. And... Um, I said, look, we're doing a gig at um, Greystones Inn. Can you bring the band and open up for us? Um, so that happened. Um, anyway, us guys, you know, from, from Gin House were watching them. And um, Kelly gave me that look. And it was the look of approval. Now, Kelly's one of those guys that... <laughs> Hey, if he's going to give you that look, the guy's got to be good because Kelly just doesn't give you that look otherwise, you know. So, um, anyway, that's how I met Jan, Emma and the rest of the band. And um, from doing hardly any gigs, um, soon I was getting them two to three gigs a week. And um, 
yarn only about oh, less than 10 years ago confessed to me that hey you know when you got those first gigs <laughs> we only had enough songs for one set because most of the most of the gigs were three setters <laughs> and they just jammed or made it up as they go, went along you know um, and then I can remember Emma getting a bit slack so she wasn't turning up to rehearsals and Jan came up to me one day Emma being the singer he came up to me one day and said look um, we're, we're sacking Emma and I've gone what? He said, yeah, look, she won't turn up to rehearsals and stuff. Um, and we've tried, you know, two or three other women, girls, young ladies, and um, don't really... He said, I'm going to, I'm going to give uh, singing a shot. And I've gone, to myself, I've gone, oh, God, this is not what I <laughs> took on to manage. Anyway, um, love and behold... I hear him for the first time and I've gone, fuck, <laughs> I'm going to give up singing. <laughs> I mean, this guy, this young, young kid, you know, like I, I think I mentioned before, he was 16. Like, not only was he an extremely gifted guitar player, but once he started singing, he was a gifted singer as well. So, yeah, that's how I um, met Jan and whatever yeah um so they became chase's son so yeah so i managed them for um probably two and a half years and then i decided to relocate to perth because you know my daughter was there and the grandkids and then yarn um formed another band um, and I th can't think of there was a promoter at the time um, who was pretty well known. I just can't think of his name. He took them, took them on, and um, they he named them Freeway. Not not quite an original name, but anyway, and that lasted for a little while, um, and then they became Reinsart. Uh, after his surname, because it's Jan Reinsart, and then back when I got back here, because uh, we stayed in Perth for five years, then relocated back. Um, uh, what's his name? Ryan Van Ginnett, the bass player from Chase's Son. He he was. Um, holding a jam down in Penrith and um, said, went back to Howler, who's the drummer from Chase the Sun, and said, man, you've got to come down and check this young guy out. And they did. And not long after that, Chase the Sun was born. Wow. So um, that's how that came about. And that's, if I take a guess, that was somewhere around 2010, something like that, yeah. yeah. And were you doing the Blues Explosion by then? So, yeah, so Greg, when, while I was in Perth, I had a lot of time to think because I found it was hard to get into the blues, blues scene in Perth because it was only a pretty tiny scene and you know of course the locals had sewn it up because when we were there a lot of the venues that were having blues were residencies so I apart from jamming a bit um, I didn't really do much over in Perth so I had a lot of time to think and I thought about well you know the scene in Sydney um, was really dwindling, you know, um, even back then, um, in 2000, we'd, we'd lost some venues, and I thought, geez, I'd like to do my part to try and 
improve, you know, do my little bit to try and improve the Sydney scene. Um, also promote up-and-coming artists plus the established artists, meaning, you know, giving them an extra gig or two. So I came up with the Blues Explosion concept and it was, became Tony Cheney's Blues Explosion. So the idea initially was um, let's, um, let's find some venues with a decent stage and um, a decent PA system because like, you know, if I was going to get bands to do a show, I wanted them to have, you know, a good stage, etc. Um, and I'd put two bands plus a solo to open up. So, um, for example, you know, Chase the Sun, you know, PJ O'Brien and Genevieve Chadwick. Um, and yeah, so the first venue I approached was Shell Harbour Workers Club and they liked the idea so they gave us our first gig and on that first gig it was the Gin House Blues Band, um, Cass Eager and Christina Croft's band. Um, and that went reasonably well. It could have been better, but it was our first show. So um, I'm talking audience-wise. I think we had, you know, 100 people in the audience. But it wasn't too bad for a start. Um, and then, you know, I started approaching other venues. Um, beaches at the Rule. I mean, they looked after us for a long time. Um, probably gave me about six, seven Blues Explosion shows a year and then they had a sister hotel up in Budgiewoy, the Central Coast, who gave me, you know, similar amount of gigs and then, you know, um, wherever else I could take the show. But they were the main, the main um, venues we played at. Um, and then you gave me, that's when you gave me a chance to film. I filmed down at Waves. I filmed at Beaches for you. That's right, yeah. And then you did the Vanguard show with Alison Penny. Yeah, that yeah. Was a, that was a sold out show. That yeah, was. so... Chase the Sun, that was a great show. Yeah, so with, with those gigs, Greg, um, you know, with, with the coast and with Beaches and Shell Harbour, we had a guarantee. And then you mentioned the Vanguard shows. Um, with those shows, you've got to... Basically, they're a ticketed event, yeah. as most people know. And yeah, I, the, on that show there was Ray Beadle. Um, yeah, Chase the Sun and Alison Penny. Yeah, um, yeah. and yeah, it, it sold out, which was great. Um, so um, I can remember that show really well, um, as you do. I've still got a photo I printed out of you out the front. That's right. With your yeah. hand showing the soul. Yeah, show. yeah, that, that was that a was great. Yeah, I'm really proud. Really happy about proud that. Proud moment. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, like I, I'm not sure, but I think that venue was about 130 people. So when you you've got a ticket venue, a ticketed venue at 130 people, yeah. and you sell out, it, it's pretty good, you know, because things that you know. Well, even back then, weren't that easy, and certainly now are even getting harder. Um, that was a big. Uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but that was a big thing for me mm -hmm. because up to then I'd been doing hotels and RSL clubs. Right. So the Vanguard to me was always a prestigious venue. Yeah. So when you asked me to do it, to me, I felt like I was starting to go up a bit in yeah, my filming yeah. and that, which was really helped me because straight after that show I had enough confidence and I approached the Enmore Theatre. Right, right. And then that was my biggest show I did after the Vanguard. Right, well there so, you go. And then from then on I, I ended up doing Blues Fest 2013 so everything sort of started from 
the vanguard. You helped me with the vanguard. Well, that's really that's really nice to know. You know, um, yeah, yeah, and you know, um, thank you because you know I know you do <laughs> you do so much for the Australian blues and rock industry, and a lot of it, you know, is unpaid for and stuff like that because mm -hmm. you you know like it, it um, you just love doing it. So um, yeah, so thanks. But it's good. That's a good thing to know that that yeah. inspired you to yeah, go to well, big, bigger yeah. and better things. Yeah. And then, how did you come up to think about doing the blues on the water? So, just if we can just stay with um, blues explosion, I just mm -hmm. explained that after doing X amount of um, blues explosion gigs, I thought. I wouldn't mind another tool to um, to promote the the artists, the up, uh, upcoming artists, and and established. So I came up with the CD concept. Yeah. So um, so then what we'd do is um, we'd get twelve, sometimes thirteen acts, and um, the compilation um, CDs came into into Vogue. So um, the initial idea was to go from volume 1 to volume 12. Uh, we were successful in going to volume 6 and I only stopped because you know CD sales started to dwindle um, because of Spotify and everything else and I found that you know I had quite a few CDs piling up in the garage and you know basically because a lot of people weren't buying CDs anymore we stopped at six volume six but having said that um, you know I was still happy that we went along with the CDs because a lot of the people that bought the CDs discovered those artists and um, we did really well with the um, in the Australian Blues and Roots charts. Um, three of those CDs went to number one. One went to number two. Another one went to number three. And when we've bought out Volume One, um, the earliest one, um, Tony, um, um, not Tony. Uh, what's his name from? Um, from the Australian Blues and Roots charts, Malloy. Um, anyway, he had he had um, come up with the with the concept of the Australian charts. So there was no chart when Volume One was was um, produced. So that's the reason you know that didn't have a chance to chart. But answering your question with um, Blues on the Water. Um, when I was in the Gin House Blues Band, and which you know was around for 21 years, one of the first gigs um, we ever did was um, a Rock's Rhythm Boat gig. So what you had to do there was you hired the boat, and um, it was your responsibility to get enough passengers on there to um, have a blues cruise. And in those days, you know, we didn't really... It was, wasn't like now you've got Facebook and all, all that stuff on the internet. It was just word of mouth. And, you know, for 20 years, we... Um, we were able to get enough people on that boat to do four to five gigs a year. Um, so after 20 years, when you know the band um, started to you know lose contact with those people that have been supporting it for a long time. For different reasons, um, Leah said to me, and Leah's my 
you know, fiance and partner in crime. She does all the computer stuff. I mean, without her, um, I couldn't have done Blues on the Water because um, you need somebody that knows their stuff back the front. And um, thank God for Leah because Blues on the Water wouldn't have existed. So we got together and oh, initially she said to me when we started after 20 years when we'd lost our audience and I mean you can't complain 20 years is, 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 um, is a good run but she said to me I oh, will give it away now and I said no and she goes what do you mean no and I said well I just whether I'm playing on that cruise or not I just love being on the harp and I don't know of a better gig than you know blues on the water oh well I wasn't blues on the water I mean than the playing Sydney Harbour at that stage I hadn't come up with the name so I said I don't know of a better gig than playing on the harbour and she says well what do you want to do and I said give me some time and I'll think about it so after about two weeks I came up with blues on the water and I went to the computer and I thought surely it's going to be taken that name's going to be taken surprisingly enough guess what it wasn't so I quickly <laughs> registered it and um, then I, I said to Leah I said look this is the name and I said what we're going to do now is we're going to hire Sydney's top blues bands who um, who've got pulling power and um, and have them on on cruises so good old phones going again um, so anyway that concept now believe it or not has been going for 10 years blues on the water in January um, so you add that 10 years up with the 20 years previously with the Gin House Blues Band and um, we're going to be celebrating 30 years in um, January, Feb um, of cruising on Sydney Harbour um, like I said 20 years with the Gin House and 10 years with Blues on the Water It's a big thing isn't it? Oh, you know, like Greg, I can still remember. I can remember because in the original um, Gin House, Gin House Blues Band, Rick Lum from Hush, he was the bass player. And um, I can still, I, I'm pretty sure it was Rick's idea. He'd heard about the boat from somewhere and um, I'm pretty sure it was him. And... I can remember on one of the cruises, the guitar player, um, Jonathan, got sick and so um, we rang up Steve Edmonds and I'm pretty sure that was Steve because Steve does about one cruise a year himself um, and Steve, I'm pretty sure that was Steve's first harbour cruise gig as well. He, he um, debbed in and played guitar for Gin House. So, um, yeah, we just recently, well, Sunday, what's today? Um, Tuesday? So we just had a, a Blues on the Water um, cruise with the Bondi Cigars. They're one of our regular um, acts. And um, it was a beauty. Um, and, you know, be a hard thing for me to give up um, Blues on the Water because I love that gig so much. Like I said, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be me playing on there. I just like being on the water with a band and, you know, having a drink. What's, you know, there's no, nothing that's any better than that. So, yeah, um, that's basically what's involved with Blues on the Water. We hope to be going for a little while longer. 
So, so you've been doing it for a lot of decades. What about when you emigrated here, Cheney? Uh, where did you come from originally, you and your family? Yeah, so, yeah, thanks, Greg. Obviously, Cheney is a European name. So um, I was born um, on the Isle of Malta, island of Malta, in 1951. Um, my dad um, was in the Merchant Navy and um, my mum was a housewife and when I was uh, four years old there was three of us, there was myself, I'm the oldest, my sister Francis and my brother Charlie and they, um, you know, they'd heard about Australia because back then, you know, it, it, you know the word went, word went around that it was the, you know, go to Australia, it was the land of milk and honey. And Malta being um, part of the British um, colony back then gave us the right to be entitled to the ten pound pom deal, so in nineteen fifty four, my parents immigrated here with us three kids. We um, we lived with my uncle for a while, and then um, they had they both got jobs at Smith's Crisps which was located in Surrey Hills back then and um, they worked their asses off as a lot of Europeans do when they come to a new country and before you know before too long they um, bought a, a terrace house in Redfern and Re Redfern was a pretty good place back in 1954 I mean it still is now but you know um, and Probably by 1958, four years later, you know, my parents owned a TV, a washing machine and a fridge. And back then, to be owners of those three items, you know, it was pretty good because, you know, TVs hadn't been out for that long. And, um, yeah, so we had a good life. Um, and then, unfortunately, um, when I was nine... So we'd been out here for eight years. Um, first of all, my dad received a telegram stating that um, my mother's father, my grandfather, wasn't too well. So they decided to basically sell what they had and um, move back to Malta. So we're, we're just getting onto the boat, well, just prior to getting onto the boat, I should say, Dad receives another telegram, because it was a six-week voyage. Back then it was boat, you know, it wasn't, you didn't get on a plane, and it was a six-week voyage, as I just said. But then he received a telegram saying that um, his mother wasn't too very well, but he didn't say nothing to my mum um, because you know he didn't want her to get upset any more than she was and after getting to Malta and living there for a while you know my parents have spoke and decided look we've got to go back to Australia because you know it's the place where we should be the only thing being is, by this time, living six months in Malta, um, they'd, you know, chewed up most of the money, the money that they had. And um, so because my father had spent time in the Merchant Navy, he decided to get on a, a vessel, a cargo vessel, because he had the experience, and work his passage back here. And then after six months of work back here, he was able to send us the money for our fares back to, to Oz. And by then, 
while he was over here, um, my other sister was born, Vivian, and um, so four of us end up coming back instead of three, to, to my father's delight. Um, you know, we once again lived with some relations for a little while, and then he, um, my dad bought a, a five-acre property, and after buying it, he confessed to us that, hey, um, the property doesn't have any water on it <laughs> or electricity. And it would be like quite a few years, which turned out to be seven years with no water and eight years with no electricity. Um, and it was just barren. We had to cut down, you know, trees and stuff like that. And we built it basically a tin shack. Um, between the three of us, my two, you know, my brother and um, my father and myself, um, where there was no insulation on the inside, um, it was a bare, bare floor, um, it was made out of tin so it was hot in the summer and freezing in the, in the winter. The only thing that was uh, new was the roof because, you know, you didn't want it to leak so um, yeah so the farm then became a piggery we um, built our own dam and stuff like that and up at one stage my father had 800 pigs um, and um, it was a really hard life but the good thing about that was that it made all us kids appreciate everything that we have today. So um, that was the the really good thing of you know we, we, we didn't my, the only shoes my parents could afford was you know we had to have school shoes so they scrimped and scraped for them but on the farm we just um, well you know went around barefoot. It was. It was just natural for us. We didn't know any better. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, in short, a little bit about um, coming over to Australia and my upbringing. Um, going back to music, um, you know, I was in a band, I was in, how I, I should, suppose I should start out as to how I got involved in music. Um, I remember when we were back in Redfern, um, this song came on the radio. My parents had a, one of those dial radios and um, it was on top of the fridge and I was only a little bloke then, you know, like eight, eight years old. And Teddy Bear, Elvis Presley's Teddy Bear came on. So we had a stool and I grabbed the stool and um, I put, you know, put it next to the fridge and put my ear to the radio because I, I just love this song. Well, like I said, Teddy Bear, Elvis Presley. And that was the first time I can remember music really grabbing me. Um, then also at, um, at Redfern, we used, there was a lot of cowboy um, movies back then. And there was this one that not too many people remember. You know, they remember Gunsmoke, they remember Rawhide and all those other ones. But there was one called Gunslinger. And the, the, one, the thing about Gunslinger is I loved the theme song at the beginning. So I would um, go right up in front of the TV and, you know, sit on the floor cross-legged and couldn't wait for the theme song to come on and I'd start singing at the top of my voice with my parents in the background. So they were the first two... Um, first two instances 
that I can remember where music really, you know, really grabbed me. Um, then um, I was working and the place I was working at, I remember going across the road to um, to to buy some lunch and went into this shop and he had bits and pieces and there was an album with this guy, um, um, long haired guy and I went, oh this looks interesting and pulled the album out and it's John Mayle, The World of John Mayle. Um, so I bought that and so that was the first ever blues um, record I bought and I, I'm pretty sure I was about 19 then. Um, from, you know, before then I'd heard like the original Fleetwood Mac and absolutely loved those guys. I mean, I, I really think that you don't get it much better than the original Fleetwood Mac and, you know, as far as Eric Clapton being called God back, back then, well, I think if anybody's God, it's got to be, you know, Peter Green. Mm -hmm. um, that's my opinion anyway. Um, other people I really admired, of course, that blew me away. And who wouldn't have, who wouldn't have been blown away by Jimi Hendrix when he came onto the scene, you know? Um, and then... Um, and in 1980, I remember um, my mate John, who was just record crazy, like he'd buy old peas. He, he was just a, a bit of a hermit, and all he'd do was go and buy import records, uh, anywhere from two albums to sometimes he'd come home with six. He spent all his wages on albums, and he'd lived in his mother's garage, and you just walk in there and you just have piles and piles of album, you know, all around the garage. And um, one day, I'll, so he introduced me to a lot of bands that I would never have known of. He introduced me to, you know, one of my very favourite bands called UFO. Um, you know, Blue Oyster Cult. Um, just you know, so many great bands, family. Um, anyway, um, one day when I went to his place, he'd just gone to a concert and he said, Tony, um, I'm going to... What, what happened is that he, he actually smuggled in his little record, recorder and taped this concert. And he said, Tony, look, I've just gone and seen this guy called Rory Gallagher. He said, and I've taped it. He said, have a listen, see what you think. And the first track I heard was Walking on Hot Coals by Rory Gallagher, live. You know, he's, he's taped the whole show. And I've gone, my God. I said, is, is he doing another gig? He go, no, that's the end of the tour. And I was really, oh, I had to wait five years um, before Rory um, hit our shores again and by the way I've still got that tape John gave it to me um, of the recording anyway I had to wait five years and um, it was 1980 and at that time like yourself Greg I was into photography um, and um, my then girlfriend was extremely generous. She bought me a Minolta camera. She bought me the the wide angle and the the telephoto lens. And um, so we made sure we were right up the front on the stage, so I could take some um, good shots. So Rory was doing two concerts, two nights in a row, 
So we went to the first one, went to the second one, and there I am with Robin and all my gear, which you know, you know what it's like with your photography gear, you, you just protect it like anything, you know, you look after it. Um, so I'm there taking shots and all of a sudden they announced Rory's coming out for the encore and he was doing a track called Shadow Play. Now in, at that time, that track was my favourite Rory track. And till this day I can't explain it, but from being there right up the front, um, taking photos, all of a sudden, and till this day I swear, nothing was premeditated. But next thing I know, I've leapt onto the stage and I'm going towards Rory and Jerry, the bass player, and I've snuck in between them and joined them on the chorus for shadow play. In the meantime, later on, somebody told me the bouncer was coming, coming at me a zillion kilometres an hour, but Rory's put his hand up. In other words, it's okay. So, I'm doing the chorus with them, and then, obviously, they've noticed that I could sing. And they've parted like the Red Sea and left me in the middle. <laughs> and I just remember, like, I've been in bands for a long time, and I've heard some, you know, I, I just... I've heard some loud bands, but I, I can remember probably because it was the Capitol Theatre, the, the amount, the volume, it was incredible. I, this great big wall of sound and um, anyway, so they let me, basically let me finish the song on my own and then I can remember, you know, I've just leapt off uh, and... Um, rejoined my girlfriend, didn't say a thing. We were living in a place called Marylands at the time, which was a, probably a 40 minute drive. And we had to walk to the car as well, which was probably another 15 minutes. I didn't say zip um, well after we got home. I was just like, and by the way, I don't take drugs, never have. <laughs> So it wasn't it wasn't drug influenced or anything like that, or alcohol fuel because I'm just a social drinker. I like I said till this day I can't explain, but it just just happened and um, yeah yeah. Um, Do you have the photos? What happened was it was back in 1980, um, Greg. So. As you know, Bob, uh, Bob King like, is one of the biggest photographers of all time as far as rock him. Before him, Philip Morris, um, and there's been a few others, but um, Bob was there. Now, unbeknownst to me, when Leah heard this story, she contacted Bob. Um, but um, whether he didn't look for him or... Um, he didn't get back to Leah, so I don't know if anybody, you know, because back in those days there was no iPhones and not many people took cameras unless it was, you know, people like you and I at the time who were, you know, really wanted to um, get shots of um, the people, you know, the performance we loved. Um, yeah, so it would have been nice to, you know, if there was a shot out there, but if, if there is, I don't know about it. So, um, but actually, um, you probably know about Bob King's book. Mm -hmm. it, I made it in there. <laughs> something to the, the words was something like a deranged punter. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
yeah. What so, about your photos? Do you still have the ones you took? Of Rory? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're here somewhere, yeah. Oh. yeah. You should yeah. get them out. And... Yeah, look, I've, um, I've um, got them somewhere. I will look for them. Um, but I did come across, or Leah came across, a few, oh, probably in the last six to nine months. But they're, they're, they're here somewhere, I'll f I can find them, yeah. So, th what was the first band you've ever played with? So, I'll just, going back to that, I lived with my, I had to move in with my cousins um, for a while while working at this place because where we lived back on the farm was too far. To travel, you know, it meant a, a two hour trip each way. So I moved in with my auntie and uncle, and Paul, my cousin, um, was working at the same place. So one day we got off off the train, and it was about a 15 minute walk home. And for some reason, I started singing once, once again, an Elvis song. Excuse me. And my brother Paul, my brother, my cousin Paul said to me, oh, you haven't got a bad voice. Um, do you want to join the, join the band on for me? I said, what, what do you do? He says, I play guitar. I said, oh, rhythm guitar, which I didn't know at the time. Anyway, um, he, his mate Philip um, played lead. And he said, well, if you join as a, as a singer, he says, um, we've just got to find a rhythm section. So within no time, they came across a rhythm section that had been playing together for a while. And back in those days, as you know, a lot of you know that you could rehearse in the garage. There wasn't any noise pollution problems. And um, so we got together with um, the rhythm section and it was like, oh, what song should we kick off with? And uh, it was decided everybody knew Gloria, you know, by the band Them. And um, so we jammed on that, and then a couple of other things, and um, the band was formed. Um, when it came to a name, I can't remember who thought of it, but somebody suggested the Playboys. So that was very short-lived because soon after we found out there was a band called the Playboys that were pretty pretty well known that we didn't know about. So then I took the responsibility of um, fi finding another more original name <laughs> and I came up with the Verb. Um, so, I was the eldest, I was 16, the other guys were like 14 and 15, and um, nobody knew how to get a gig at that age, you know, we didn't have a clue. But, we're all good Catholic boys. Yeah, so, um, then the Catholic uh, Church got hold that we had a band together, and at that time, um, the, you know, they wanted us to do a gig. We didn't e exactly know what the gig was. We just said yes and, you know, excited to do our first gig. Love and behold, we <laughs> the gig turned out, out to be um, the Horsley Park um, Festival, Festival of Saints. Uh, don't ask me what saint it was. Um, so we turn up, and here's this truck <laughs> um, where all the gear was set up on a tabletop truck, and um, just thousands of people. And, you know, we were a little bit, wow, <laughs> taken back. This is going to be our first gig. Um, you know, and um, anyway, we went on, 
and I can remember the other guys were a little bit, you know, <laughs> look at all these people. And um, but anyway, it didn't seem to bother me for whatever reason, and we went on and did the gig, and as far as I can remember, it went okay. And um, yeah, that was our first gig. Um, my first, um, I can remember being in another band, and you know, back then it was like a lot of bands starting up more rehearsals than gigs or hardly any gigs and at one stage I said to myself no nah, I want to get into working band so in those days if you bought the um, the Sydney Morning Herald at the back there used to be a, music, a musician's um, classified section so I looked in there and this band wanted a vocalist and uh, they were only up at Marylands. I was living in Smithfield at the time so it was only a short run, you know, maybe 10 minutes or maybe less. So I've said to my friend who was a bass player, I said, do you want to come with me? I'm going to go audition for this band. So we turn up. And I'm greeted by Martin, the bass player from this band, and he says, sorry, your mate can't come in. I said, you can't come in? No, he said, it's a closed rehearsal. And I thought, oh, this must be serious. So anyway, poor old Phil had, Philip had to wait. And um, after the rehearsal, they said, well, you know, the job's yours if you want it. And luckily, I knew a lot of their songs. They were called Solid Ash. Um, luckily, I knew a lot of their songs um, because they said, we've got a gig on next week in Helensburg, <laughs> which is where I happen to be living now. <laughs> and that was like... Um, back in 1974. So Solid Ash, as they were called when I joined, decided they were going to have a name change. They'd already picked out the name. Uh, Giza, which was spelt G-E-E-Z-A. -E -E so our first gig in Helensburg was under the name of Giza. Um, not long after I, um, I joined the band, um, it was decided they wanted to get a different drummer, so I got the drummer in from the band that I was in previously, and, um, yeah, from not gigging hardly any at all, I was doing, you know, anywhere from two gigs to four gigs a week because in those days you also played at um, school lunchtime gigs. Um, we, we were doing, you know, our repertoire was blues rock based, Humble Pie, um, Stones, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and um, not long after, we um, decided we wanted to play checkers. Now, checkers, as a lot of you would know, um, well, a lot of older people would know, it was the best gig in Sydney, and there's never been anything like it since. Um, it was in Goulburn Street in the city and um, used to feature um, three bands a lot of the times, especially weekends, three bands a night. They had two small stages on each side of the main stage. So on the small stages like Giza, Finch, 
would you know be rotating from like um, eight till midnight half an hour each and then at midnight you would have your sherbet's um, kush which um, kush was Jeff Duff as a lot of you probably know um, Ted Muller again they were the the headliners so they'd come on at midnight and do their hour and a half set and then the other two bands would rotate from then till three o'clock in the morning so it was a long haul you know you're there from well you probably got there at seven and you were there till three in the morning um i can remember one night and we'd only been together for six weeks at this time and um The other band, like, as I said, um, the two support bands would rotate and the other band, it was their turn to, um, to go on and all of a sudden, through the PA, you've got, ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Rod Stewart and his entourage. So Rod had been playing at the Ramwick Racecourse and of course wanted to party on after the gig so he ended up at Checkers with um, a few people from his entourage and um, when I heard this I thought about thank God we don't have to go on mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway <laughs> that was short lived because um, the bass player Zamp from the other band, something went wrong, so the guy that looked after, you know, that was in charge of what was going on said, guys, you, you go on. So we end up playing, <laughs> shitting ourselves and playing in front of Rod Stewart. So yeah, that's my little Rod Stewarty thing. Um, and what year was this? So that would have been 73, Greg. Yeah, 73, because we'd only been together for six weeks. Um, yeah. Um, probably 18 months after I'd been in the band, um, Steve Rondo, um, who was, you know, a manager, took interest in the band. And... Um, next thing he wanted to, to manage us but what happened the outcome was that um, he wanted to change the band quite a bit because at that time Gary Glitter and Hush were um, pretty big on the scene and he wanted a excuse me another glam band anyway when I heard this um, it was like, no, nah, it's not for me. <laughs> you know, we're doing all this great material that I loved and all of a sudden you want to dress me up in, you know, glitter and look, it's all right for the people that love it and want to do it, but it's not my cup of tea. And um, when I left, two of the members that I'd bought into the band that were in the band previously with me, they left as well. But, you know, hey, good luck to the boys because Steve's idea went well. Um, so it was called the Geezer Rock and Roll Show. Yeah, mm. that's right, Greg. Soon after, they called themselves the Geezer Rock and Roll Show. Bought in another drummer, so they had two drummers. Um, and, yeah, they did pretty well. I mean, um, even today when I mention people... Um, I mentioned Giza to people, they remember because at one stage Steve got them, there was a show which you'd remember Greg called the Super Flying Fun Show and that was like on every day, it was a kid's show. Mm. Now, Marilyn, I don't know, I think her name was. Marilyn, yeah, yeah. Um, apparently <laughs> she had a kid's show and the boys, because you know Giza and I stayed mates, but apparently um, 
she swore and carried on like a trooper mm. and she's running a kids show but you know they opened every morning for six months they opened up and closed that show with a song mm. so you know um, not only that you know we had Donnie Sutherland's and of course Countdown which people watched religiously um, they did all those shows um, on TV, you know, um, even when I was in the band, you know, back then it was a lot of um, police boys club, Hornby, Hornsby Police Boys Club, Curl Curl Youth Centre was also a huge one. And you know, here we are and you're on the same bill as um, Chain, um, the Lardy does, you know, Ticket, who were um, a New Zealand band, um, you know, Ted Mullery, Kush, God knows who. And, you know, you could be the... Because back then, it was nothing to do two gigs in one night, as you know, Greg. Yeah. So what you'd do, you'd open up at Curl Curl Youth Centre, and, you know, here you are, you're, you're the opening band and the kids are carrying on as if you're the headliner. You know, they got excited. Um, so you'd open up in Curl Curl, then you'd go to Cabramatta uh, Police Boys Club or, you know, the White Eagle Hall at Cabramatta and you'd headline there. You know, um, so yeah, some damn good times back then. I can remember the funniest thing was um, Steve got us a gig at the Cooma Civic Centre and you know we didn't have a clue where Cooma was you know what so we rolled up there in t-shirts mm -hmm. <laughs> so by the end of the gig it's blooming cold as you know and um, you know, there was only some flimsy blankets where we were staying, so we all, we slept two in a bed cuddling up to each other, it was that cold, you know. Um, so yeah, there's some funny stories there too. Um, but yeah, um, it's been, it's, it's been, you know, one hell of a ride. I mean, only four years ago I celebrated, um, 50 years in the music industry and um, you think wow you know like where's where's that time gone you know after after gin house um, I had a bit of a break because I felt like after 50 years yeah. it'd be nice to have a break and um, then I formed a band called the Ark Riders and um, because I'd realised, you know, I'd been in the industry 50 years and I don't even have a record, mm -hmm. you know. So I thought, look, I'm going to have a go at songwriting because I'd never written anything. And I came up with um, five originals and then I thought, OK, um, you know, people aren't shy of putting covers on their albums these days. You know, you've got people like... Um, well, a lot of blues artists will do a whole album of covers. I, I wanted to have, at least on my first album, you know, some originals. So I come up with five originals um, and then um, thought, well, look, you know, I like this from the original Fleetwood Mac and I like this from a band called King King. So I recorded 11 tracks with the boys from Chase the Sun because at the at the time I didn't have the Ark Riders. So Ryan, the bass player, had a studio in the Blue Mountains and um, we, we recorded the 11 tracks. Um, I was really happy with the way it um, came together. And um, after re recording the album, I know Th Threadbow Blues um, festival gave us a gig so I hadn't actually formed a band then because 
like the boys were only going to record with me from Chase the Sun. So, but they, I got them a gig at the festival too. So they played there as Chase the Sun, and they were the band, the Ark Riders band behind me at at Threbo. And then I came across a guy that just um, come from uh, Argentina, Australia, Juan Pablo Oidonius, and um, when I heard him play, I couldn't believe how good he was, and um, I formed the Ark Riders. Um, in the meantime, the album um, went to, entered the Australian charts at number five, and the next week went to number one so I mean how happy was I I hadn't re never recorded an album like it went to number one so that was another nice achievement um, and yeah so at the moment I've only got blues on the water happening um, I am going to get another band together hopefully bring bring Juan back from Argentina because um, he's now resides there again um, and do an Ark Riders reunion but I will have to put a band together um, I've, I'm not looking at working you know flat out or anything like that I'm, now I'm hitting 71 I just want to do the occasional gig as long as it's a good gig um, and I'll be there. Um, so yeah, that's about it. There's a lot more I could tell you, but you know, <laughs> we've only got so much we can time. We another time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And th thanks so much, Greg, for being here and um, coming to the house and um, doing this because I, you know, as everything um, that you do, I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Tony. It's my pleasure. Thanks, mate.